Coming up on Koshi's Business Builders, learn how to position your brand to appeal to customers. Matt Moran shares his secrets to keeping his staff loyal, plus how a gin company is expanding their business internationally. Hello and welcome back to Koshi's Business Builders. Did you know that cash flow is the number one issue affecting Australian businesses? That's $76 billion worth of outstanding invoices and 2 million businesses drowning in a sea of unpaid bills. More than a third of owners have to dip into their personal savings to keep their businesses afloat. The new research from the invoice market shows cash flow severely impacts their ability to pay personal bills and also to pay staff. It just isn't right. So what can you do about it? Visit koshisbiz.com.au for our three-part series on how to handle your cash flow and help protect your business. All right, let's get stuck into today's program. And leading it is celebrity chef Matt Moran, who's sharing his keys to success. Also, Find out how boutique distiller Four Pillars Gin started exporting internationally within just four years. But first up, Puppy Preschool. Amy Smith created this great little business when she realised up to 200,000 Australian dogs are put down each year. She says that's because they don't receive the right training as puppies. So we sent in branding expert Simon Hammond to help Amy expand her business. Australia has one of the highest rates of pet ownership in the world, with dogs being the most common choice. After growing up with animals all her life, Amy Smith founded a puppy preschool in Sydney, offering a four-week workshop to help pet owners train their new pups. We sent in Simon Hammond to find out more about the business. So Amy's Puppy School, huh? I, I guess I know what it's about. Sure. Tell me how it started and why you started it. Sure. I started my puppy school, it's been running for about seven years now, and um, it's basically a four-week course that I do for pet owners and their new puppies. Right. The puppies are within the ages of eight and 16 weeks, and they do four training sessions with me, and we cover all the basics of raising a new pup. Right, so it's quite an intense period with a young puppy. We can train a dog at any age, really, to do yeah. anything within reason, but it's that socialisation, that building confidence and, and making sure we raise right. these really fantastic, happy-go-lucky pet dogs. With Amy working single-handedly on the business, Simon has some advice on how she can develop her profile and take the company further. So tell me what you actually do then. Yep. Tell me the, the nitty gritty of, of puppy training. Sure, so I cover all the basics in raising a puppy. So it's all about exposing the puppy in a positive way yeah. in this first eight weeks that they're with their it's new human. It's a small human. window. It's a very small window. And people don't know that, do they? No, and if it's missed, it can cause a, a, a lifetime of behaviour issues. It's probably the number one cause of death of dogs in this country. Is that right? Yeah. Explain that how's that, well, <coughs> how's we, that work? In Australia every year, we would put down somewhere between 150 to 200,000 dogs every year. And you're yes. saying that didn't need to happen, that mostly doesn't need to happen? Yeah, you know, if people put the right effort into their dogs from a young age, they can absolutely yeah. avoid things like that, so... It's in interesting, in my, in my work, I always look for the why. I always look for the why what you do matters. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like that's why it matters. That's why, that for me, that's why it matters. One of the things I've noticed about your business is that you describe a lot about what you do and you describe how you go about it. And mm -hmm. I think the secret to getting a business like yours at a much higher profile is to develop your point of view. Mm. So it's okay to say what you do and describe how you go about doing the training, but what's your point of view? And the fact that there are up to 200,000 dogs that don't make it because the socialisation doesn't get up to speed, mm. that's a really important reason for, for a business to exist. Yeah. And a lot of the time businesses don't spend enough time telling me as a consumer why they think they matter. Mm. So what's your point of view? Why are you getting out of bed in the morning? Not just what do you do? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because you've got a good story to tell. Yeah. You know, storytelling is the best way to build a business profile. Yeah. And if people can tell your story for you, that's amazing. Yeah. So if I hear you talk and I go home and say to my wife, 
I just heard Amy talking about this stuff and this is what she's saying. If I'm telling your story, it's a good story. Yeah. So it's got to be good enough that people tell it for you. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It really does. And I reckon you've got it. We'll be back soon to get more great tips from Simon on how Amy can position her brand to emotionally connect with her customers. Most businesses understand the importance of insuring against physical risks such as fire, but did you know cybercrime is on the rise? 60% of all targeted attacks in Australia hit small and medium businesses in 2015. But did you know most cyber attacks are caused by human error? The average cost of business was a huge $276,000 in 2015, with over 30% of small businesses in Australia experiencing a cybercrime incident. Phishing and scams accounted for 34% of cases, followed by identity theft and compromised web servers. One in four small businesses were also very concerned about the risk of cybercrime in 2015. Are you properly covered? Antivirus programs and firewall technology can help, but are often not enough and your existing business insurance policy may not provide sufficient cover. If you're unsure whether you're protected against the consequences of cybercrime, a steadfast insurance broker can help. For specialist insurance advice and protection for your small business, get a steadfast insurance broker on your team. Visit steadfast.com.au. After the break, we visit a former Olympic athlete who now runs a boutique gin distillery in Victoria's Yarra Valley. Discover how Four Pillars Gin are staying true to their vision and now exporting around the world. You won't want to miss it. After competing in the 1996 Atlanta Olympics, Cameron McKenzie turned his energy to winemaking before then focusing on the production of craft spirits. Since 2013, he's been the heart and soul of Four Pillars Gin, which was financed through Australian crowdfunding platform, Posible. Let's find out how he did it. Innovation for, for distilling is, is part of the great fun of my role in that 90% of my time I'm making the same gin, rare dry gin, over and over again, keeping it consistent and keeping the quality at the same level. But five to 10% of my time I get to play. We get to play with different botanicals. We're constantly looking at different native botanicals, different peppers and spices out of Southeast Asia. So that allows us to play and play and play. So Four Pillars Gin started like so many great ideas do, over a few drinks with a couple of friends, both of whom I worked with in the wine industry. and. Being in the wine industry, gin was very much our white spirit of choice. It's aromatic, flavoursome, balanced weight, texture, very similar in a way to wine. But where we started was we wanted to make a tonic water because we were a bit frustrated that it was very limited, the, the, the tonic in Australia at the time. That conversation just rapidly moved to gin and we started a gin distillery instead. Australia imports 97% of its gin. We felt at the time we had a very compelling story to tell because we have some of the most unique native Australian botanicals. We sit on the doorstep of the spice trails to Southeast Asia and we don't have any rules, so we don't have to make London dry gin. So we felt we had a pretty compelling story if we could get the recipe right. We initially started out at the back of a mate's winery in Warrandyte with one still, Wilma, who's behind me, and in a very small bonded area. In the last three years, we've grown quite dramatically. We now have three stills. We export to around 14 different countries. We make about seven different gins. All of our gins have won some quite crazy accolades around the world, which is, is pretty humbling for some guys that started out on this project maybe five or six years ago and only launched about three years ago. Exporting for us initially was a little bit tricky in that there's not a lot of Australian spirits exported. Where we had to be very careful was selecting the right partners in export. Initially, we gravitated to wine partners, which was the space that we knew well, but we've rapidly found out that wine and spirits are acutely different when approaching the trade and trying to build your sales overseas. So over time, we've been more specific targeting importers and distributors who are specific to spirits rather than wine and spirit sort of crossing over a little bit. I think if you want to find a partner overseas to distribute your product, you have to get on a plane and go and visit the market. You need to see what products are being widely distributed and well distributed on the shelf. See 
if they're in appropriate venues, whether it's bars or retail, are their prices being respected, uh, how old is the stock on the shelf, and you start to talk to bartenders and retailers about who they like dealing with and who's professional and can represent you in a professional manner. We've got a range of partners in this business that are incredibly valuable to us, from spice suppliers who I speak with pretty much on a weekly basis, distribution partners, Vanguard who, who distribute our product in Australia, all of our export partners we talk to pretty much on a weekly basis, right down to people like Australia Post. We, we couldn't manage our database and our new releases if we didn't have a system that could efficiently get our labelling done for us to pack it and get it out to our consumers on a, in a timely fashion. So yeah, there's, there's no partner in this business that isn't valued greatly. The advice I would have for, for trying to build a new brand in Australia is to surround yourself by people who are better than you at the things you can't do. Part of the success that we're having is a work ethic. We don't count the hours. We put our head down, our tail up, and we get on with it. It's an incredibly hard-working team here. It's not a single staff member here that I wouldn't feel comfortable putting on a plane and sending to London, New York, Beijing to do a brand presentation. And I think don't ever be afraid to fail. There's been 25 gins that have never seen the light of day here. Like the less said about the asparagus gin I made, the better. But you've got to be prepared to go and jump the shark occasionally and then bring it all back and, and see where it takes you. It's not a big deal. You've just got to be fearless. Every day distilling here is a great day. Uh, I completely love it. Uh, it's, it's fun, it's interesting, it's challenging, it's physical. I'm on my feet a lot. I stopped wearing my Fitbit. Uh, because it's, you've just got to be. You can't sit at a desk and do this. You, you have to get up and be moving all the time, and getting your hands dirty. I totally love it. It's the best job I've ever had. Coming up, we get more fantastic advice from Simon, who shares strategies for how Amy can position herself as an expert to get media exposure. Plus, chef extraordinaire Matt Moran on being innovative in and outside of the kitchen. Earlier in the show, Simon Hammond spoke to Amy's puppy preschool about building a strong brand. Let's get back into it for more tips. So Simon, how would I go about expanding the brand? Well, I think it's about expanding your personality of the brand. So I think it's about making sure that the brand of Amy's Puppy School, as in Amy U, is expanded through a number of key areas. First of all, developing a point of view. So then that becomes maybe the lead into the website. Rather than the website being rational, yeah. the website could easily be, as a, as a landing point, emotional. This is why I'm here. Take that and then use it for public relations and, and for profile building. Yep. Try and do speeches, try and do talks, try and pick a time where the media is talking about something and you ring a radio station or you ring a newspaper and say, what you're talking about here, these numbers of dogs, let me tell you what's really going on. And, and offer yourself in a media sense as an expert in this, this area you believe in. Just be out there and make sure your brand means something and your personal brand means something. Cool. What about getting known? What, what, what is it about, would you like to get the business more known and have you thought about that? I think, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm very well known um, in, in the area, which is great. Um, yeah. I've got a great relationship with a lot of the vet clinics around here and, and the pet stores and, yeah. you know, most of my business is through word of mouth, which is... Well, you're doing all the right yeah, things that's the best. straight away. Uh, but what I would love to sort of head down the path of now is, is getting some bit of sponsorship, I suppose, maybe, getting mm -hmm. some pet companies on board. There's some really simple ways you can do that. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways is to understand what corporates need from you. What they need is access to consumers. And, and, and they need someone that consumers trust. So the segue between I'm a corporate and there's the consumer is a trusted key opinion leader. That's you. Mm. So put yourself to them as a key opinion leader. So if you were to go to a pet care company, um, you would say to them, I, I'm happy to talk to you about um, being part of what you do in the world because people listen to me. And it's, you are this sort of funnel and, and in many ways you can amplify their message with respect. So you've really got to go to them understanding their needs and their needs are trust. If they tell a consumer, they might not believe them. If you tell them, they will. 
What useful tips from Simon, who said the key to an effective brand is when people can tell and share your story for you. So if Amy is focused on her purpose and learns to emotionally connect with her customers, then she'll get free advertising through word of mouth. Hi, I'm Matt Moran and I'm chef and restaurateur and here we are sitting in the beautiful, iconic Aria. And if you haven't noticed, it's just been renovated after 17 years. Now, I really wanted to do it before someone told me to do it. Now, I believe success comes in many different ways. Great locations, and if you look at a lot of my restaurants, or just a few of them, North by No Fish, Chiswick, Opera Bar, Aria, Aria Sydney, Aria Brisbane, or even River Bar, they are in great locations. But also, people like to you know, surround themselves with lots of luxury, whether it's you know, good acoustics, good wine lists, good service, of course, good food. Now, I think the most important thing is surround yourself with incredible people. Now, if it wasn't for my incredible staff, I would not be where I am today. And we have about 40 staff that have been with us for over 10 years. Guys, there you go. Thank you very much. Coming up on Koshy's Business Builders, I answer your latest burning business question. We'll be right back with Ask Koshy. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Koshy's Biz, for more inspirational ideas for your small business. What a terrific show. Thanks for joining us today. I loved hearing about how truly connecting with your customers can help create a strong brand story. It's all about establishing that genuine relationship and positioning yourself as a trusted expert. Great stuff. Up next, I'll be answering another great viewer question. You won't want to miss it. When you're trying to get a new business idea off the ground, things like looking for the perfect business name, domain name, social media profiles, or registering for an ABN and ACN can really slow you down. Instead of wasting your time filling multiple complicated registration forms, you can sign up to digital services such as Veromo, which lets you find and set up your different accounts using one simple online form. Plus, you can even check the availability of your ideal business name, matching domains, and social accounts in a matter of seconds. Startup services like these are a one-stop solution for potential entrepreneurs considering jumping into the world of small business. And to get you started, Veromo are offering a 15% discount through smallbusinessfirst.com.au. Time now for another Ask Koshi, and I have my expert here to help answer one of your tricky business questions. Today, we have Cindy Batchelor, Executive General Manager for NAB Business. And Good to have you here, Cindy. Now, Bob Alden has sent in a video and it's a beauty. Let's check it out. Good morning, David Kosh. It's uh, Bob Alden's from Car Business just outside of Brisbane. Mate, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you and to put my question to you. Um, and it relates to reconciliations. I've just spent days doing reconciliations, but there's got to be a better way of, of doing it. I'd really appreciate your advice as to the way that you think um, small business operators and certainly small business operators with one person uh, should do their bank reconciliations. Love your show. Thanks very much. Oh, Bob, I can sympathise with you. We all have to do our bank reconciliations. And Cindy, it looks as though Bob is, is a NAB customer. Uh, on behalf of Bob and all of us, help! How can we make reconciliations easier? <laughs> Absolutely, and, and it is it is a time-consuming exercise, so we really need to try and, um, and make it as simple as we can. So two things you can bring together, your internet banking, which has all your banking transactions, and then a small business also would benefit from an accounting software package like Xero. Right. So you bring those two things together and the software enables you to import your banking transactions into the software and match it up to your expenses, to your invoices, to all those things that are actually connected to the business. Now, if the software doesn't get an exact match, it'll actually go back and say, is there something similar here? So again, oh. really good time saving. So it almost has uh, artificial intelligence yeah. to figure it out. Yeah, but there are some, I suppose, some really important things we need to do, particularly yeah. if you're setting up a software package. So at the very beginning, you've got to make sure that the data that's going into it is accurate. 
Um, and you might need to get some help. You might actually need to engage with a bookkeeper or an accountant if you have those sorts of resources. Or even a, um, a university student's often quite helpful too if you're setting up a business like that. Yeah, and, and also these accounting software packages, because they're cloud-based mm -hmm. now, they're easy to access anywhere, anytime, and they have their dashboards there. Absolutely. It makes running your finances so much easier, does it? So much easier, and I think they've really built these accounting software packages now for small business owners who are time poor. Right. So much easier to, um, to operate, and, and automation is a key to that. Yep, and using the data to improve your business is critical, isn't it? No, absolutely, because the data actually gives you information and that should link back also to your business plan yep. to see, you know, what are you um, expecting to do in terms of your revenue and also your expenses and are those things actually playing out over time? So it gives you a really good ongoing record. Yep, exactly. Cindy, great advice. Bob, hopefully that helps. The new technology, it is easier. As Cindy was saying, these new accounting software packages are so easy to use. Give it a go. Thanks very much for your time for this episode of Koshi's Business Builders. Look forward to catching up next time. Hey, thanks for dropping by the KBB YouTube channel. If you want a whole lot more where this came from, press the subscribe button and it will open a Pandora's box of great videos that not only are educational, full of great advice, but also really inspiring. Just what we need as small business owners.